Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on January 24th. Just a reminder it is all in the realism overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. Our first mission was a contracted launch from viewer Dylord Root and it was a space telescope to be placed between the orbits of Venus and Earth in a circular orbit 120 million kilometers away from the Sun. And so this is that space telescope, it is called Mr. Lonely, and it actually has a KOS script that goes with it where it communicates its uh, sadness and other sentiments, but we'll run that later on. You can see it's got a hull cam VDS camera inside what is basically an air intake, and actually it was made to look like a face I believe was the idea, uh, possibly a screaming face. But anyway, I used uh, SSTU uh, mod part for the for the booster to get it into the designated orbit, and then we launched it on a Falcon 9. Now this is a Falcon 9 from the KK Launchers pack, as opposed to the last tech pack, because the last tech pack doesn't work very well in 1.0.5, and so I decided to use the KK Launcher pack instead with a custom configuration that I put together. It's pretty easy to configure it since it didn't need to be resized. So there we go, a Falcon 9 launch. I'm going to use the same script I was testing out before, a KOS script to launch it. There's a generic script for two-stage launchers. And here we go, ignition. And off it goes to an orbit between Venus and the Earth. And just a reminder, the launch videos are going to be sped up, up to four times the actual speed that occurred. I believe this one is a little bit more than three times. But uh, the idea to have it match real-time as closely as possible. Actually, the KK Launcher's uh, Falcon 9 is not too bad on the, on the whole lag issue. For some reason, the larger the physical rocket, the more lag it creates. It doesn't matter, I mean, engines do matter, but it doesn't seem to matter as much as the physical size of the rocket. And I wonder if it's actually far making all the calculations on the surface area of the rocket that's actually causing a lot of lag in realism overhaul as opposed to the stock system without far. Anyway, here's first stage separation and second stage ignition. That uh, caused me a little bit of a worry uh, as of course the KOS script has to ignite the engine and I was worried that the fuel would become unsettled if it took too long to do that. It was supposed to only take, you know, a half a second and since this video is sped up, you know it actually took like a few seconds before it actually ignited that second stage. So yeah, a little bit worried about that. Now uh, action group 1 is coded into the script to activate as soon as the fairings go off, so that's why you saw the solar panel deployment then. And everything else is looking good for this launch. We are going to try this KOS script with a variety of launchers during this video. And so we're just starting out with Falcon 9, the other launchers are all progressively bigger. Okay, getting close to orbit here. Let's see if we can shut it down properly. And there we go. I still haven't gotten it as so that it could get into the correct apoapsis and periapsis. It just gets to somewhere like 300 by 200. It's more like 320 by 220, somewhere roughly there. And it gen it's generally satisfied with that. And I guess I probably won't tinker with it too much unless I have a very clear idea of what I want to do. Uh, because I don't want to mess with it since it seems to be able to get any old two-stage rocket to that apoapsis and periapsis, so I think I'm satisfied. Anyway, here I'm plotting out the, the circular orbit that was specified, and you can see we have an initial transfer orbit of over 3,200 meters per second, and then the circularization will take about 1,700, and we have plenty of delta V for that. We're starting off with the second stage of Falcon 9 since it can relight. And here it's under my control. I haven't written a script for this sort of transfer yet. Okay, and the stage is running out. Set. And here we have some Gemini lander engines, which have quickly become one of my favorite engines. These are from the FASA pack. They're basically overgrown one kilonewton thrusters. They've got uh, they've got like ten kilonewtons or something like that. But uh, they're convenient. They burn aerosene in two hundred four. They actually have you know, a moderate uh, ISP considering they're burning those fuels. It's 311 in vacuum, which is reasonable. 1960s-ish technology. 
Anyway, here I am getting the one end in the right place, uh, 120 million kilometers is what was specified. And I'll adjust it with RCS to get really, really close, but it'll be interesting to see if we can maintain that after circularizing. It tends to end up a little bit lopsided, but there I go plotting the circularization again, and that will of course have to happen in about half a year. 163 days, so I add that to alarm clock, and this probe is all set to go. But, like I said, there is a KOS script that goes with it, that Dialord Root wrote. And so I decided to run that script and see what it does. There we go, saved it, the Mr. Lonely script. And running the Mr. Lonely script. KOS is interesting, it always requires you to put the period at the end. There we go. Okay, so why do you do these things to me? Yeah, you can immediately get the tone of... Uh, I, I'm sorry it's a little bit muddled because I didn't clear the screen beforehand, but uh, I'm all alone out here. Ugh. I mean, it, it keeps... Uh, every now and again it throws out a comment like that. So cold out here. It's, it's very depressed. Uh, I compared it to um, Marvin the Android from Hitchhiker's Guide, that kind of thing. Uh, Colonel Panic, much lonely, very sadness. Yeah, and it's not even departed from Earth yet. Imagine how it's gonna feel once it's really in its designated location. Anyway, sentient space telescopes, probably not a good idea. This is the Halcyon pod, an upgraded version of Aeronim's uh, crew transfer capsule. And we're trying this out in 1.0.5 for the first time to see if it works out uh, just as well as it did before. And so I'm putting it on the Kingfisher launcher, which was the launcher that I made especially for it. That has an M1 engine at the bottom and a J2X. So here we go with launching it. And with this script, I have to replace the thrust weight ratios each time. That's how it figures out the difference between one rocket and another. You have to type in the initial thrust weight ratio, the second stage initial thrust weight ratio, and then the final thrust weight ratio. Okay, here we go. Ignition and launch. So the mission for this is to actually bring back down three members from the, space, uh, the shuttle crew. We have a space shuttle in orbit, the Curls one and so we need to bring back the shuttle crew so that they don't run out of food, water, and oxygen and that will allow us to get on with interplanetary missions. One of the problems is that every time we send Kerbals up we need to take care of their life support and we can't just overrun uh, the point where they run out of life support when we're trying to conduct interplanetary missions like the ones we have currently going to Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. So yeah, we've got all those missions underway and I want to get down to them, but we have to make sure our supplies are good. Okay, so first stage set. And... What a long... that's a long gap between ignition. It always makes you worried that it's not going to have its fuel settled. Okay, so on we go. So that this is going to rendezvous with the shuttle and take three members down. There's actually four shuttle crew, but this can only accommodate three. So there'll be one left over. And I was debating whether to have that one do a re-entry test with the shuttle, or maybe just have the lone Kerbal just sit there with the remaining supplies. It'll have four times as many supplies as before. Okay, continuing on. You can see the sort of adjustments that the script makes. It's fairly gentle, but it does have to uh, correct wildly sometimes, and sometimes as it's getting close to orbit, it goes into negative territory on pitch just to finish it off. But there we go, uh, 326 by 204 is the ending orbit. Successful. Uh, well, at least as successful as this script ever does. Now, then I had a problem, because we didn't seem to have connection. What actually happened was that the Halcyon pod had a communication dish from the Tentaris pack, that wasn't properly configured for remote tech. It was uh, configured for an older version of remote tech, and so remote tech got confused. So even though we clearly have a connection that line there, and clearly a signal delay which indicates a connection, uh, it uh, remote tech was totally confused by that one antenna that was configured badly. Uh, I eventually fixed that, and we were able to test out the Halcyon pod properly. But I decided not to bring down the shuttle crew on it during that test. That'll be in the next episode. But I still needed to deal with the shuttle crew, and so I decided to send them supply, more supplies. So um, we deorbited their old supply container, so 
Either we were going to bring them back down, or I was going to send them more supplies, so I decided to just send them more supplies. So here it is, and I wanted to test a new rocket launcher with the script, and so this is actually a Falcon X. So this has nine Raptor atmospheric engines on the bottom, and then one Raptor vacuum engine on the top, and I used the best numbers I could get. Uh, these are of course SpaceX engines, SpaceX's next-gen engines burning methane and oxygen. The Raptor atmospherics get 2,300 kilonewtons apiece, and the Raptor vacuum gets a little bit more than that, but not too much more. Basically, it's the same sort of ratio that we see with the Merlin engines, and I figured out the likely mass of the engines, and I just used what ISP they've been saying, SpaceX has been saying. I don't know if this is going to be the final configuration of these engines, or if they are going to cluster nine of them on the core, or anything like that, but as far as I know, this is the best idea for how a Falcon X would operate. The models I used for the Raptor engines, the atmospheric engines, I used the model of the Clockheed Martian uh, Space Shuttle main engines, and then for the vacuum engine, I used the model of the FASA M1 engine. And these seem likely to me to be close to what they would look like and close to the likely size of the engines. The Space Shuttle main engines have about the same thrust as the as the Raptor atmospheric engines are intended to. Anyway, unfortunately I didn't have real plumes configured for these engines. Off that goes, and now the, the Raptor vacuum engine, which is of course burning methane and oxygen, so it has that plume instead of the normal plume for the M1, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Based on what we have here, it seems like a Falcon X will be able to carry 60 to 64 tons to orbit. Uh, so about three times, well actually four times what the Falcon 9 can do. And so that's pretty good, and partly that's because of the more efficient fuel used and of course the greater thrust. A three core version, a Falcon X Heavy if you will, might be able to carry up to 200 tons to orbit, especially if it has cross feeding, though that would be some pretty hefty cross feeding. But, uh, well anyway, we will see. So this is all speculative, we haven't even gotten Falcon Heavy yet, so is all highly speculative. But actually, the Falcon X will be able to carry on its own more than Falcon Heavy will be able to do. The KOS script handles this one pretty well. Um, it gets past apoapsis and does not get confused by the time to apoapsis changing, even though time to ap apoapsis is in the script, so it could potentially have had a problem. But I handled that appropriately, it seems. And there we are, 362 by 226. A little bit high on the apoapsis, but uh, it sure could be worse. You have to look on the bright side sometimes. Anyway, payload separated, but I found the flaw. And the thing is that between 1.0.4 and 1.0.5, Realism Overhaul went away from Module RCS FX and just uses the normal Module RCS now. And so these RCS units got reset, basically, to the default fuel, which is hydrazine, I think. Uh, or anyway, they, they were reset in their uh, fuel, and so they were misconfigured. I had just uh, opened the craft file of this, you know, resupply vessel, and I forgot to double check the RCS units. So I ended up having to rendezvous this with the module tug. This was a suggestion from a viewer. I think it was that Lord Root. Um, so this is the module tug from the shuttle, and we had just left it adrift for a while and the two docked together. So the module tug, which had properly configured RCS, well, at least its core RCS was properly configured. Those arms that go out, those are RCS arms, those were not properly configured anymore. So I, I ended up having to fix those too. I did fix all of them. Uh, it's all better now. But uh, yeah, just had to make sure the parts uh, specified module RCS instead of module RCS FX. So they were all connected, and I ultimately did the docking of that supply ship to the shuttle off-camera. So I did that later on. Here we have uh, another viewer submitted payload from Bakernot. This is a TDRS satellite, a tracking and data relay satellite, because everybody seemed to think I needed more communication satellites, so I got plenty of them here. And so this is headed for Geosync. But uh, in my late day madness, uh, this was late Sunday, 
after streaming for about six hours, I decided to try and build an N2, which is sort of my my improvement on the N1. Everybody complains, the, the N1, everybody says, well, 30 engines all clustered together. Uh, crazy, crazy, right? Uh, my initial idea was to have uh, 16 on the core and then 4 on the boosters, and I, I eventually make that version. But since I wanted to try out my KOS script with this, I decided to try and get it so I could get into orbit on just the first two stages instead of using part of the third stage, which meant this had to be much bigger on the bottom. And uh, there you had seen me putting a dummy payload instead of Make or Not satellite, so there's no longer uh, the TDRS launch. It was way overpowered for it anyway. Um, so in order to get into orbit on two stages so I could test the KOS script, I needed these boosters with nine engines and a 12 engine core, which is crazy, right? So now we're lighting 48 engines <laughs> on the start, and this will be a great test of my processor and everything. So the maximum I can speed the video up is by four times, so you can sort of take that into account. It will be sped up four times. Ironically, it turned out that I couldn't use my KOS script because for some reason KOS wanted to use two ignitions instead of one, and these engines were only configured for one ignition. It only seems to have this problem with certain engines, and these are among those engines. So ultimately, I had to actually launch it on my own using Smart ASS for some help, and uh, I probably should have just made the smaller version of it, you know, with the 16 engines on the core and 4 engines on each booster. The reason I wanted that configuration is because basically, you would uh, make the engines in sets of 4 instead of having a huge cluster of 30, and that would improve the plumbing and therefore uh, the whole system. Anyway, well, we launched with 48 engines, and uh, maybe that's a better. So the idea was obviously to make sort of a sort of marry the N1 with the Soyuz, and that's why we have the booster system here. Oh, there I'm showing the fact that uh, that smoke screen. Even though I told it to limit the particles to 400, it couldn't do it with 48 engines. It couldn't figure out how to only make 400 particles. It ended up making like 2,000. That was hilarious. It just couldn't manage it. Now for those who don't know what the N1 was, the N1 was the Soviet moon rocket and it was supposed to have 30 NK-33s or NK-15s on the first stage, 8 NK-43s or NK-15Vs on the second stage, and then uh, other engines further on. Uh, since I'm only focusing on the first two stages here, I'm not gonna go past that. So here I've got 48. NK-33s on the first stage and 8 NK-43s on the second stage. Um, the boosters just went away with 36 of the NK-33s. There's just 12 of them left now. It does have a phenomenal payload to orbit, thankfully enough. Uh, of course, its launch mass was over 6,000 tons. In the end, I think uh, its payload to orbit is uh, between 220 and 250 tons. So that's pretty good. Here goes the first stage, second stage ignition, and that was ignited well. The tanks were from Tentaris, but the engines are from Bobcat Soviet engine pack. This was just a test launch, so I wasn't uh, too bothered. We're not going to continue on with this. I think I actually reverted because I don't want the space junk in orbit. But yeah, just testing out the system, and here we see that it is getting close to orbit, very high g-forces, but in this case not above 4 g's. And there we are, 259 by 217, and we are in orbit. Everything worked out fine. To wrap things up, I decided to show viewers some variants on the Falcon X rocket that didn't use other Falcon X cores as boosters because after all we'd have to ignite a lot of engines and we just saw a lot of lag thanks to that. So how about some SRBs? So there's a European variant on the Falcon X with four Ariane boosters and this can get 120 tons to orbit and uh, with 9,700 meters per second you can see there. And so that's equivalent to the Saturn V rocket, that sort of payload to orbit range. The next variant is with Russian boosters. This is uh, RD-171 as uh, boosters, just four of them, and that can get 150 tons to orbit. So uh, these are actually the boosters off of the Energia rocket, uh, which would have, uh, which did launch Buran once. 
And then the final variant is with the spatial SRBs. These are actually the five segment ones, the ones that will be used on SLS. And four of them, rather than two, can lift this with 200 tons to orbit. Now, because of the added power, I had to put two Raptor vacuum engines instead of just one because there's no way that uh, just one would have enough thrust weight ratio to deal with the 200 ton payload. So I had to make that modification to make it work out. But that rocket ends up at uh, 5,800 tons. The boosters each weigh about 750 tons, so it's 3,000 tons just with the SRBs there. So there you have it, that was the stream from January 24th. At the end of it, I think I pleaded uh, to viewers to submit payloads for interplanetary destinations. I had a bunch of, of communication satellites submitted, and actually in the next episode I'll be launching more of those. And uh, I really want to get to the interplanetary stuff in this. Now we have launched other probes that are still on their way, but uh, yeah, I want to accelerate that a little bit more in the future. So uh, on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.